In part one, I talked about why bridges are important and the engineer's role in bringing them to life. Now I'm going to talk about the bridge in context and why it's important to understand that context if you're really going to produce an effective uh, design. Some engineers, if you ask them, would say that bridge design is just about the span and what's it carrying and what's it crossing. But I want to show you that it's about much more than that. In my experience, right at the beginning of the project, you need to take time to consider all the elements that are going to influence the design. For a start, is it a railway bridge? Is it a highway bridge, a footbridge? Perhaps it's a moving bridge, an opening bridge. And these have obviously fundamental influences on, on the design approach. So for example, one aspect is the issue of speed. A railway bridge is something which is experienced by people in a railway carriage, usually at high speed. So the quality of the detailing is less important than on a footbridge where pedestrians walk slowly, they stop, they pause, they lean on the handrail and so on. And in a bridge like that, issues like the touch, how, does thing, how do things feel become important, which is completely irrelevant on a motorway bridge, for example. So those are very important factors. I like to spend time right at the beginning really immersing myself in, in all of that, going to see the site, understanding all the issues that affect the bridge design, looking at, it, looking at the site from afar, going to it close up, imagining what it would be how it would be experienced by a variety of different kinds of people, different kinds of users, cars, pedestrians, cyclists, and so on. So, uh, we need to understand a variety of different factors and by and large I think they come into three sorts of groups. There's the environmental and physical ones. Simply, what are we crossing? Is it a deep valley? Is it a wide open plain? Is it the city? Is it the country? Those things. Where are people coming from and going to? Secondly, there are the issues of the culture, the sort of society, because I think actually a bridge in some parts of the world would be quite different to bridges in another part of the world where cultural and societal issues are different. And those are factors you need to understand by going to the site. And thirdly, it's all about the practicalities, the constructability, the access. How do we get there to build it? And so local, local knowledge is really important. Bear in mind that you're very often coming in from outside. You're going to be creating a, a bridge which is going to be experienced by the local population for generations to come. You may not be there. So that's really important, understanding the local site. So um, you, you then have to somehow conjure up in your mind what this bridge is going to be. I remember standing on the shoreline at, um, in Hong Kong at the beginning of the Stonecutters Bridge competition, the Rambler Channel stretches in, in front of me, trying to visualise this enormous bridge at the time, the longest cable stayed bridge in the world, over my head, 70 metres up in the air, and the scale of it, very difficult to do. A sketchbook is the only way, and so I would encourage engineers to learn to sketch with a sketchbook because that's the only way you can really do that, understand what it looks like. Sometimes the, the site that presents itself to you suggests a different, or different option entirely to what perhaps your client is expecting. And as an example of that one, I'll point to the Swansea Sail Bridge in South Wales. We had been told that the bridge was going to go across the river at a, at a relatively narrow place, a logical place you may think, from a supermarket to a technical centre. And on the one side there was going to be a new development of hotels and businesses where the old docklands used to be. And on the other side um, is the city centre. And so we were, we were given a particular location but it became clear to me that it really wasn't very satisfactory to go from a supermarket car park into the back door of a technical centre. And that there was a much better site, which would have been slightly longer and, and demanded a curved alignment between uh, a natural piazza, if you like to call it that, on the one side, where we could make a, a landing place to make it an interesting environment for the bridge, and on the other side, making the way, pointing the way into the city centre. So we ended up doing the bridge for the same budget, but nearly twice as long. And I think it was a much better solution. And of course, this is all about footbridges. And, and with footbridges, um, it is very much about the, the experience at each side and how, how we deal with the, what's called the desire lines. So imagine if perhaps this is a, a river and uh, we want to cross the river. 
and on one side perhaps there's a housing development or something, um, and maybe there's a, there's, a, there's a sort of piazza, there's a sort of open space, maybe other buildings. Maybe there's a big church, uh, which is a f an important feature, um, which, which you know, is clearly very visible in, 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 in all sorts of views. And on this side, I don't know, perhaps there's a, there's a way towards a school here, um, and, on, and on the other side maybe the city centre or something. Um, so that in, in, uh, in imagining how the bridge is going to work, and perhaps there's a footpath along one side of the river which needs to be picked up. So you could imagine how the footbridge would respond completely to this sort of site by uh, aiming at the things that people want to go to or what they want to see. Um, you know, the, clearly the church is, a, is, a, is an important view. Um, the access down onto the footpath each side of the river, you know, that sort of thing. Those are the, 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 the desire lines, the things that are going to affect the, the appearance of the bridge and the form of the bridge. The other issue is scale. Um, so um, imagine, for example, you know, we know about the Mio Viaduct, which is this wonderful deep um, valley and the, and, and the bridge that goes across at very, very high level. But uh, you know, we, we've all seen this extraordinary structure, how many is that, seven. Um, and the thing about the scale of this is it's huge, it's very high. And if you were to be up close to any of these elements, it's, you know, they would be enormous. Um, if I was to draw a person on here, you wouldn't see him. Um, and we know the Eiffel Tower fits underneath it. And that has a particular kind of scale effect. It suits its environment. But a completely different scale, you see, for example, would be if we had, let's say, um, a, a little river uh, crossing a, a, a wide open valley. Uh, and, and this is now maybe um, uh, only a matter of you know, tens of metres rather than hundreds of metres. Then, then perhaps you know, you're talking about a rather different sort of scale. And yes, may, maybe you want to do a sort of gen gentle arch. Um, and, and that could be quite a nice way of doing it. Um, but it, the scale in relation to the person, you can, you, I often draw little people because the, peop, the person, you wouldn't see a person on the Mio Viaduct in that view. But you know, here, perhaps on this scale, you would. And, and, and understanding how you feel in that scale is very, very important. And the, the size of the elements, the scale of the elements, the scale of the whole construction is all about sitting it in its environment, in its, in its context. So far we've been talking mainly about bridges in the context of the developed world. But of course there's also the developing world where communities very often in very poor rural um, situations um, need bridges across ri rivers that flood and so on. And, and the bridge can make an immediate difference, a life and death difference between you know, being able to get to hospital or getting to market or, or whatever. Um, Bridges to Prosperity is a charity, for example, that is working in this kind of uh, scenario. And they build suspended bridges, suspension bridges, um, which f for which the designer doesn't need to spend time dealing with some, so many of the issues that we've discussed so far, because it's really just about a practical solution to a very physical problem. And the quality of the detailing will be completely different. Another example of that is, for example, in a uh, design and build tender situation where you haven't perhaps got the luxury of a blank sheet of paper and a, a new concept as you might have in a design competition. You may have a, a client's reference design already given to you and your task now working together with your contractor is to optimise that design, to find the economies of the design, make it easier to build. Yes, perhaps to, um, to produce some nicer details and make it that little bit more attractive but it's, it's a slightly different approach. So again, adaptability is an important characteristic. The thing about designing for a long time, a long life, uh, and bridges, as I say, have to be designed for 120 years plus in this country, um, is that you need to be able to predict some of those things that could happen. And we know that in the current world, we have to deal with the idea of climate change, sea level rise, and so on. And as an example of, of this, how we had to adapt uh, a design, is the little bridge we've just recently completed in Greenwich. It's a swing bridge, footbridge, across the end of Deptford Creek. But there the Environment Agency wanted to be able to raise the river wall in the future to allow for sea level rise. So we had to design the bridge to be partly removable. So on one side the, the, the approach structures are all removable so that uh, one day the Environment Agency can come and raise the river bank and then we can put the bridge back. Earlier I pointed out that among the factors that we have to consider are the, the, the practical ones of constructability. 
And when we approach a site and we look at it, uh, we analyze how can you get large pieces of equipment and materials to the site. Um, that will have an impact on the design. Um, these days we tend to minimize the amount of environmental damage and disturbance and disruption on the site as far as possible by making large pieces off-site, fabricating things away from site, assembling large components, bringing them to site using heavy lifting equipment. And with the Pont Schumann in, in France, this is a bridge across the River Seine in Lyon, uh, we had to consider the fact that um, the, 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 the river has already a number of other bridges um, all along it, and this, this bridge is going to need to be assembled somewhere off-site. There's nowhere on the site to be able to assemble all the bits. So we had to make it off-site and bring it up river. And this bridge is actually a, um, a twin arch bridge. It's rather rather elegant thing. Um, and what we did was to um, uh, build the bridge where um, we, we laid the arches on their side. So whereas the, the, the arches in their final condition are standing up in the air, of course, we were able to assemble the bridge, discussing it, obviously developing this with the contractor, with the arches laid on their side so that we could bring the whole piece up river on a barge and then put the arches up into place, assemble the whole thing, and then lift it up in one piece where the whole piece connects as an arch. Each span was done that way. And it's very effective. Uh, again, the economics makes sense because you build things off-site, minimum disruption on-site, um, and of course also very dramatic to see that happening. In this part, we've looked at the bridge in context. Um, the importance of immersing oneself in the site, understanding the local conditions, um, looking at the environmental and, and cultural and, and constructability issues. We've learned a little bit about how to be adaptable to different kinds of circumstances uh, in terms of the contractual circumstances or the cultural ones and the social ones again. Being able to visualise the bridge in its context is very important, the, the, the importance of being able to sketch. So having looked at the bridge in context, in part three, we're going to start looking at the engineering structure, turning the bridge into a piece of functioning structure. But of course, in practice, in the engineer's mind, the context and the structure really go hand in hand, and you can't really separate the processes. They happen together, but for convenience, we've separated them.